I, the disheveled goblin, dub the One Piece. The okay, I okay, I know it's this isn't the volume I'm reviewing today. This is an early on, but I I've been reading it digitally since. This, so just go along with I'm just please be. It's only physical. Just okay. We're, I dub the the greatest. Ma okay, I'm still. Is it manga or manga? I think it's manga. Okay, we'll get back. Okay. I dub thee the greatest manga I have. I feel your judgment that this is naturally part of the saga I'm reviewing. I'm. I can't buy them all. It's expensive. Good lord. Get off my. Back. Fair warning to fans of the trap banger I made and included in the last episode of Fantasy News. There will be no trap bangers for this One Piece review. I, I do apologize. I did want to have a straw hat on, but it's been delayed in the mail. So next Wednesday. So in the last One Piece review I did, it was the Alabasta arc, which some people were upset with how not detailed I was. They wanted it to be a full on summary. That's not what these videos are intended to be, though I am going to be leaning heavier into the spoiler filled review because as many of you pointed out, this manga has been going on for ages and most people who are gonna be watching these videos have read them. So I'm gonna go ahead and yes, continue the entirely spoiler filled review angle for this series. And I'm sorry I missed last Wednesday. I just wasn't able to get through the arc, but now I have and Sky Island Continuing the theme of One Piece just improving is my new favorite arc. Is One Piece gonna become one of my all-time favorite series? So this arc picks up pretty much right after Alabasta ends, and what we are seeing is that Miss Sunday is actually snuck on board our disheveled little crew. Yes, I am giving them the moniker of disheveled. They've They've earned it. They're goblins too, each and every one. I'm a fan. And keeping directly in with Luffy's character, she's like, I wanna join. And Luffy's just like, you were an antagonist like 20 minutes ago. So sure, welcome aboard, friend. <laughs> Cause you know, that's who Luffy is. But there's two angles to this I really like immediately. The pitch that Miss Sunday puts forward is essentially, you saved my life, so. Now you owe me to be a member of your crew, which doesn't make complete sense, but somehow fits with the logic of the One Piece world beautifully. And that's gonna be kind of a theme I cover throughout this review, the logic of the One Piece world and how this saga has the greatest ending to possibly any story I've ever read. I'll get into why I believe that at the very end. But she also kind of individually wins over the crew and I really like how that was approached. It kind of fit each character and gave us moments to let them all shine together. And you know, okay, I've harped on this a lot, but when they're together is when One Piece's characters in this crew shine the most. And I actually find myself significantly enjoying everyone less when they're on their own, which is another thing I'll get into further on in this review. But it's very fortunate for the crew that she is here because in plot convenience sake, they then come across a whole kingdom that needs great knowledge of land and structures. And this is where Miss Sunday is going to shine. She is someone who has outstanding backgrounds in this kinds of field. So she tells them, hey, um, we're near Sky Island and they meet up with a man named Mont, Mont Blonde Cricket. The f***ing names in the series are outstanding, but they make my brain die. And he tells them of a city of gold, and this is a pretty interesting world, like there's a heavy lean into world building for this entire saga. That again makes One Piece World definitely my favorite anime, manga, world I've encountered so far, and leading him to my obscene preference for absurdism, rapidly just becoming one of my favorite all-time fantasy worlds. And that's going to play into why I think this has one of the greatest endings to any fantasy story ever as well. We'll get into that at the end, be patient. But we spend a somewhat significant amount of time with this guy and he tells our crew of his ancestor who is known as a liar for making up stories of a golden city. And he also mentions this kind of sky city situation as well. So he's kind of setting up a lot of the stuff for this arc and he as a character is highly motivated to prove this golden city is real to clear his ancestor's name. 
Okay, I will say we're going to get one of my first criticisms here, though. We rapidly are just introduced and deal with some pirates that show up, and it's just action for action's sake, really. Uh, I, again, was doing this through the manga and the anime, kind of back and forth, and they're just, it doesn't, doesn't always fit. There seems to be this need to have action. It, it reminded me of the Luffy-Zoro conflict we came across before, and it, it just felt out of place and taking away from other things in the story that I was enjoying more, the world building, the character, the introductions. Then there's just throwaway pirates who show up who are dealt with. And I'm specifically referencing Bellamy the Hyena, who to me, I'm sure is going to come back later. It very much so felt like he was being set up to come back later, but the way he's introduced and handled here just kind of felt like filler. I, I feel like One Piece is afraid that if there's not enough action, it's going to lose its audience. And I want to let you know you're not. I, I'm here for the crew. I would kill many people for them. Real world people for this fictional crew. But in continuing a theme, I guess, from the last saga, they then head up a stream into a mystical land. And we also get some information about some Blackbeard pirates that I assume are gonna play a much larger role later on. But there's also a cutaway that I initially was kind of annoyed by, but quickly won me over. And we're basically seeing a meeting of great pirates happen. And they're discussing what to do with the ramifications of what happened in the last arc. And this was not something I actually expected from One Piece. I didn't expect this series to take the time and effort to really think through the ramifications of our crew's actions, but it is, and that's actually becoming a factor of the world building we're seeing, and again, why I think world building is such a stupendous angle of this arc. And we're seeing characters already show up again who I didn't know would be showing up again. The greatest swordsman ever is there. Also, the biggest chungus Maybe whoever Chungus, when he first appeared, I was like, oh, he reminds me of Fisk from Into the Spider-Verse. Who was the bigger Chungus? I think this guy. What was his what was his name? Edward. This also gave me hope that we're gonna see Zoro go up against his rival and mm. Yes, like it. I want Zoro to eventually conquer this man. We also get like detailed cultural stuff within the pirates during this, where Edward is given a message from one of the other pirate lords and essentially says, no, if he wants to talk to me, he can come see me, which that's, oh, that's great character work, that's culture work, that's world building all happening at once while we're cutting away from our characters. And while that could annoy me, it's being done so well that I'm hooked, I'm in, I'm interested. Keep it up, keep it going. But okay, getting back to our crew, we are then introduced to the sky technology and a sky knight. There is essentially this whole world that exists above the clouds and it's filled with this outstanding fantastical technology that's different yet still feels absolutely within one piece logic that this would exist and this is one of the advantages of absurdism but out of control absurdism you can quickly lose an edge that one piece manages to keep where yes it is different yes it is crazy and it doesn't fit what we've seen within the world but because there is a consistent approach to introducing this new angle, this new society, this new culture, it feels natural and it's never taking me out of the world built so far. But continuing with some of the stuff that's kind of bothering me with the crew handling and why I actually like the character work in Alabasta more, Nami is then just kind of separated from our crew and is used to do some wider world building that I did enjoy, but it felt kind of just like, and now she's gonna go off and do this. Well, everyone else does this and I, didn't love that. But here we are introduced to the antagonist of the saga, who is essentially an electric god. Uh, going far beyond just like typical powers of Electro, this person has other enhancements that he also got through his fruit that make him, I, I'm just going to say, like, yes, he claims to be a god. And after he was done demonstrating what he does, I was like, oh, yes, uh, you, you, you indeed are a god. No contesting here. You scare the shit out of me. And partially that's that's due to the ear thing. I don't know what that is, but that that terrifies me too. Bit of clarification on a couple things I missed here. One, Enel, this antagonist who is a super powerful god, is working with a militia to defeat these local clans who are trying to take back their land from him. He's super evil. The crew, though, on the other hand, is looking mainly for this golden city because he's caught up in this conflict, but they are originally just mainly focused on finding this golden city for Cricket down back in this land because they're like, oh my god, that golden city was down there, but it was shot up by that thing, that upstream river we took to get here. 
Hope that clarifies. And I was really wondering, how is Luffy going to handle this man? Like, oh my God, how could he possibly go up against this person who has a power output that is on a like Marvel level in terms of like a heavy hitting villain, something I have not seen Luffy have to go up against. So I was really curious there. And then we even have, uh, okay, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll okay, focus on the story at hand, but okay, I'm not gonna get too into it, but there's essentially this cultural conflict that's been lasting for generations where there's a tribe weighing for survival up in the sky people and there's all this other stuff going on and it leads to a larger battle where our crew is involved and it's essentially our crew with this culture that's trying to survive against the antagonist and some of the more nefarious forces at play there. It's it's well defined and I enjoyed how it was built up but in terms of the larger picture I don't see it having too much ramifications outside this individual arc. I hope I'm wrong because I really liked what was built here but One Piece seems to do a lot of world building and then move on, though I am very much so open to coming back. But Sunday shines through this battle quite well, where she is actually able to help in her own way in the battle, and Luffy is then, okay, I feel like I've left out a lot of detail, but Luffy ends up uh, taken away from the main conflict because believe it or not, he's inside of a snake. Dragon snake? Maybe I was just mentally referring to it as a dragon, but it was a dragon snake to me. And this battle, this conflict was far more intense and interesting than it had any right to be. I was constantly impressed by not only the visuals and powers put on display, but how well each character was used and the actual like stakes at play felt very visceral. I found myself really caring. But we are essentially reduced down to Zoro, Sky Knight, and a few of other crew members versus this god figure. And he handily kicks everyone's ass, really setting him up as a prime fight for Luffy because Zoro is an outstanding fighter and we just see this person put him down and like Zoro has been built up to be someone who can give Luffy a challenge, which I guess is one of the few advantages we have from that forced conflict they have in that other arc I talked about. But uh, yeah, it really made me again wondering like, how's Luffy gonna... Okay, I mean, is this gonna feel a bit unbelievable? Maybe, because like this guy seems far beyond Luffy's capabilities. Oh, also I wanna just say at this point, Usopp still sucks and Sunday is a better character and crew member than him. I like her more. Usopp is poo poo. Moving on. So Luffy ends up catching up to this god figure. And at first I was a bit dissuaded by having him sidelined for the made battle that happened there, that climax in such a way. But I was wrong. And how they utilize him here is simultaneously creative and hilarious. Sorry, side note, I wanna say, it's interesting to see Zoro's weakness kind of be exposed in this fight where he is like one of the greatest swordsmen in the world, only being put down by the established greatest, yet, he can't really handle people with alternative powers very well. And that's how his god figure was able to put him down. Zoro is a powerhouse. He took on like what, like a hundred guys in the last arc, no problem. But how can guy with sword handle electric god? He really can't. And again, Nami is kind of weirdly brought along with this god figure uh, as Luffy is catching up with them. And I just didn't love the treatment of Nami in this arc. Like she's a better character than what she was kind of relegated to here, at least in my opinion. You know, if a lot of people disagree on that, I understand, but she's been so full of agency and now it feels like the story is just using her for exploratory purposes or allowing someone for this god figure to monologue to or talk to. So I didn't love that for her. But okay, Luffy catches up to the main antagonist and they fight. How does he possibly go up against someone so powerful? Well, he's made of rubber. How did, how did I not, how did I not see that coming? He's made of rubber and he's going up against an electric god. That, I'm stupid is what I've learned here today. I'm not, smart because I feel like everyone and their mother would have easily called, oh yeah, electric god, rubber man. Electric, no longer a factor. But no, I'm dumb dumb. So Luffy handles him easily, except he kind of gets stuck in a trap and so he doesn't actually, but he really was giving this guy a rubber, like to the point where he made the guy make this face. Luffy was just like, I'm rubber, you're not glue, but your electricity, so f you. And it was so funny. I actually was laughing out loud at my own missing this and how just great it worked in the story. But Luffy's put in a trap where he has this golden orb stuck around his hand. And you'd think, oh, 
uh, Lou Ferrino here is taken out for the count. No, he's not. Do you know why? It's time for me to say it. It's time to say it with me now. Say it with me now. Luffy's a force of nature. And so he comes back and we have an annoying flashback. I was so annoyed by this. I don't like, here's my notes for the review. I don't like random flashbacks. They, it felt forced. And I feel like this information could have been better weaved into the narrative, but okay, we get a flashback. Essentially, we find out the pirate we met before, Mont Blonde Cricket. He's the descendant of someone who came across this clan that we've been talking about, who made friends with them. And they kind of subverted a trope in a way I really like, where instead of having like dumb culture conflict with, no, they were like, bros and they were like oh you're awesome you're awesome and they like had drinks and the guy who like re like led the culture is like check out my city of gold isn't this rad and the guy was like it is rad holy sh he went and got a king came back except when he came back everyone was gone and the city of gold was gone so the king just killed him understandable for the king i, I guess you just had a whole voyage uh sent out where you know there's no city of gold, but it turns out, no, he was telling the truth. And now we cut back to Luffy just taking the golden orb that was put on his hand as like a trap and just beating the sh out of a God with it because Luffy is the rubber God. That sounds like a brand of condom. And this sends the God into a bell, which then causes the bell to ring from the heavens, letting Cricket know down below hey, your grandfather or whatever wasn't lying. And so he gets this moment of relief. And also Luffy is like projected, like his shadow is projected down from the sun. And so you see a giant Luffy in the clouds really cementing home that Luffy is a force of fucking nature. <laughs> and I love this for so many reasons. It It is absurd. It also feels like a Wheel of Time reference. And it also, also goes with One Piece logic. So much of this kind of builds together in a way where I enjoyed just the build up, the execution, and how the tone of this world assists the story in getting where it wanted to go. And that's like the cohesion to the vision of One Piece is fascinating. I don't love everything they're doing to the characters here. I was a bit annoyed by the structure of the flashback, but the, again, the overall narrative, so enjoyable. And there wasn't nearly as much work with the crew, except for like Miss Sunday here, uh, for me to really latch onto. But this it seems to have this continual alteration where one piece in one arc is going to hit you with a left of world building and then a right of character work in the next arc. So I'm not complaining. And that change up also just keeps me interested in a meta level where I'm not sure what they're going to focus on next. But in the aftermath of this, we see the culture is then rebuilding, the tribes coming back together. It's really fun. It's heartwarming as one piece often is. And I really enjoy how heartwarming and just enjoyable and corny it can be. And then Miss Sunday, also finds a uh, inscription on a wall which points them towards another weapon on the level that, that this evil god was trying to use in this arc. And there's also a message from the former pirate king and she's then like, yo, Loof Loof, check this out. So Miss Sunday proves she's far more useful than Usopp ever has been or ever will be. And then you thought I was talking about that stuff being the greatest end to a story ever. No, 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 no. That's not, yes, everything there was great, but it's, it's, it's peanuts next to peanut butter for what One Piece then gives us as a gift to end this saga because we're still up in this sky civilization. How do we get down? Well, we take an octopus balloon around the ship and are lowered into the ocean again. A octopus balloon. That's my favorite animal. I, I love it so much. <laughs> I'm giving uh, the Sky Island, I believe it's called Saga for One Piece, a nine out of 10. It's so wonderful. It has some structural issues and I didn't love the treatment of Nami, but overall, good God, this series continues to have moment after moment that just like make my jaw hit the floor in sheer nerddom, excitement, corny thrills. I just like love it. I genuinely just like love how this is happening. And I'm so, I can't believe I'm about to say this. I'm so grateful my audience bullied me into reading One Piece. You 
beautiful goblins. Anyway, let me know what you think of Sky Island in the comments down below. Like and subscribe if you have not already. And what are your predictions for my thoughts on the next One Piece arc as well? Get ready for the Wheel of Time buddy read to continue this Friday and have a good one, y'all. Peace.